Good afternoon and welcome to the 156th of the COVID calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we will talk about the pandemic journaling project with Kate Mason and Sarah Willen. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. You can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live and on Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics, and please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, October 26, 2020, there are 1,157,051 deaths from COVID-19 globally, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. There are 8,669,894 cases of COVID-19 in the United States. That's up from 8,445,242 cases reported Friday. There are now a total of 225,434 deaths reported in the United States from COVID-19. It's up from 223,437 reported on Friday, setting records for numbers of infections right now and still sticking to that 1,000 person a day death rate day to day. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline, Fire Department of New York Family Patriarch Dies from COVID-19, Buried with Vial of Blood from Firefighter's Son, Killed on 9-11, by Thomas Tracy. This appeared in the New York Daily News June 20th. A tight-knit family of city civil servants spent Father's Day weekend remembering their beloved patriarch, a retired fire department of New York battalion chief who died of COVID-19 complications and was buried with a vial of blood belonging to his son, a New York City firefighter killed on 9-11. Years ago, Chief Edward Henry and his wife Alice made a pact. Whoever died first would be buried with a vial of blood belonging to their son, Joseph Henry, who was killed when terrorists destroyed the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. His remains were never recovered, relatives said. Nearly 20 years later, a global crisis of a different sort claimed the retired chief, his family said. The 79-year-old Henry died on May 5th from coronavirus, a disease complicated by the fact that the retired chief already suffered from a 9-11 related illness. His lungs were permanently damaged on 9-11 when Henry, who responded with his firehouse, was briefly buried alive in the falling tower debris. And in subsequent weeks, as he breathed in the toxic soup on the pile, searching for his son and victims of the attack. Chief Henry's family, which includes his five surviving children and 10 grandchildren, met up for a pre-Father's Day celebration in Breezy Point, Queens. Because of the pandemic, it was the first time the entire family was together since the socially distanced funeral. It will definitely be tough, being this will be the first Father's Day without him, Michael Henry, a retired Fire Department of New York lieutenant, said. But my mother is doing well. We're a very religious Irish Catholic family, and she firmly believes that my father and my brother Joey are together now. It put her at ease. On 9-11, firefighter Joseph Patrick Henry, 25, was assigned to Ladder 21 near the Javits Center, when terrorists slammed two jumbo jets into the Twin Towers. He was one of seven men from his firehouse who died when the South Tower collapsed. At his father's burial, Joey's name was added to Chief Henry's headstone, Michael said. There was no equipment and no body, Michael 54 said of his fallen younger brother. Up until now, we didn't know where to go to mourn him. It's giving us a sense of closure. Following in his father's footsteps, Edward Henry spent 40 years in the fire department of New York, 24 of those as battalion chief before retiring in 2002. Three of his six children, Michael, Edward, and Joey, became firefighters like their dad. 
with Michael and Edward both retiring as lieutenants. A fourth son, Danny, became a Port Authority police officer, and Henry's two daughters, Kathleen and Mary, both worked for the City Department of Education. At the funeral, there were firefighters from his old firehouse standing at attention outside the cemetery, standing six feet apart from each other. Edward Henry remembered, we were really touched after being a chief for 24 years, he touched a lot of people. We were told that if he didn't die during the pandemic, his funeral would have filled St. Patrick's Cathedral, his proud son said. Okay, let's turn to our conversation for today. I'd like to introduce my two guests. Catherine Mason, PhD, is a medical anthropologist and assistant professor of anthropology at Brown University. She's co-founder of the Pandemic Journaling Project. Her first book, Infectious Change, Reinventing Chinese Public Health After an Epidemic, appeared with Stanford Press in 2016. This work draws on fieldwork in Southeastern China, exploring the professionalization and the ethics of public health in China following the 2003 SARS epidemic. Dr. Mason is currently developing a multi-sided ethnographic study of perinatal mood disorders in the United States and China. Her research has been funded by the Social Science Research Council, Winter Grand Foundation, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the US Fulbright Program and Association for Asian Studies. Sarah Willen is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Connecticut, where she also directs the research program on global health and human rights at the Human Rights Institute. A medical and socio-cultural anthropologist, she's author or editor of four books and five special issues. Her book, Fighting for Dignity, Migrant Lives at Israel's Margins, appeared with the University of Pennsylvania Press 2019. It was awarded the 2019 Jonathan Shapiro Prize for Best Book in Israel Studies from the Association for Israel Studies. She's also a former National Institute of Mental Health postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And she is also co-founder of the Pandemic Journaling Project. Kate and Sarah, thank you so much for making time to join me on COVID Calls today. Thanks for having us. So let's start the way that I uh, usually do just to find out where you're calling from and how the pandemic is looking there today and for maybe two months when I would ask this question, I had a general sense of the answer I was going to get from people. Um, and I don't have that anymore. It's very much in flux again. Kate, can I start with you? Sure. So uh, I work in Providence, Rhode Island, but I'm calling today from my home in Mansfield, Massachusetts, um, which is a small town right in between Boston and Providence. Uh, which are both experiencing big surges right now. Um, my town, the numbers are still relatively low, but they're definitely trending upwards. So we're kind of holding our breath right now. What's the situation at the university? Um, at Brown, it's actually been surprisingly um, uneventful. So students are tested twice a week as our faculty and staff. Um, and until just a few days ago, there were virtually no cases among students and contrary to sort of what's happened in some other universities. Um, but just in the past few days, there has been a cluster of cases among students. And so we'll, we'll see where that goes. Providence in general, is, though, is not doing well at all. Their cases is that are right? And this, mm, students are mostly residential at Brown or, or they live throughout the, the, the region? Um, I would say most of the time they're mostly residential, but there are a lot of students living off campus who, the ones who are actually around, um, there are a number of students who are studying remotely this term as well. Um, but the, the messaging has been, I think, reasonably effective, actually. I think that the students are really terrified of being sent home in sort of a, a, a state of, of, just humiliation the way some other students have been. And so they're really, mm -hmm. um, I, so far they have really been sticking to the protocols kind of impressively well. Um, but again, they've only been on campus since late September. Um, the first part of the semester was remote. So it's kind of hard to say where it's gonna go from here. We'll see. You're teaching remotely? I'm teaching partly remotely and partly in person. So I'm teaching okay. two courses, an undergraduate course actually on the anthropology of epidemics, um, which has been really interesting, and a graduate course. And both of those meet 
sort of half the time online and half the time in person. I have some students who are fully remote, so it's a little bit of an awkward kind of Zoom classroom uh, integration issue. Um, and I have noticed that students have been dropping off a little bit in terms of showing up in person. I think through a combination of feeling nervous and perhaps laziness, not realizing they don't have to get up and get dressed and go to class, they can just call in from just there. Jump their on room. Zoom. Yeah. Sounds like a time of great improvisation for yes, you as a teacher. Yeah. Well, thanks for that update from New England. Uh, Sarah, same question to you. I think, let's see. Can you hear me now? I think I should Great. be should be good now. So I'm also in New England. I'm in Connecticut. Um, I live in West Hartford, Connecticut, and I teach uh, at the University of Connecticut in stores. Have not seen my office since March. Um, UConn was pretty quick to make the decision to go online. So there are some faculty who are teaching in person, but I have not been teaching in person. I'm teaching a large class of 275, uh, which is fully online. And then I'm teaching a small seminar of 12. Um, and uh, we're all kind of hanging in there. In terms of uh, West Hartford, where I live, we just last week went back to, um, you know, my, my window is very much on what's happening in the schools. I have two children in school, um, including a kindergartner. It's been an interesting year to be a kindergartner. Mm -hmm. um, so our schools were meeting in hybrid format, one week on, one week off. And as of last week, they're all in person. So we are, I think, in a sort of unusual position, um, maybe an enviable position. We get uh, daily stats from, you know, well, we get reports as needed from the school. Um, there are a few cases in, in a number of schools in our district, but on the whole, the town's looking pretty, pretty good. Um, but Connecticut's positivity rate is up to 3%. So it's not clear how long this will hold or, or where we're headed. Okay, well, thank you for that update as well. And how many people did you say were in the class? 275. Wow, okay. This is the, not all of your classes, I hope. No, no, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the introduction to sociocultural anthropology course. I have the privilege of teaching once every couple of cycles. Um, okay. And this is actually fully online. So um, one of the consequences of, of the pandemic is that I don't actually have any interaction directly with my students unless they reach out to me. It's, um, mm. it's really quite unusual. And uh, I think for those of us who are teaching in this modality, one, you know, we're, we're kind of wondering, how do we connect with students? How do we sure. really bring what we have to offer into their lives in ways that help them connect with, with what they're living through? And uh, one of the things we're finding is that the project we're gonna talk about today seems to offer something in, in that, in that um, vicinity. I so. was gonna say that, that makes a nice segue into what we're gonna focus on today, which is the sort of creation of memory in real time with your pandemic mm -hmm. journaling project. And um, I wanna talk about all different aspects of it, but before we get into that, I've had um, lots of historians, social scientists, artists, people on COVID calls. And one of the questions we've been talking about a lot these last months is, um, well, two things. One is what kinds of sources should we be curating right now? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an impossible question to answer, but it's, it's yeah. a good one to talk about, I think. And mm -hmm. it's related to another question, which I'd like to start with, and maybe Kate, I'll throw it to you first and then to you, Sarah, which is um, when you look at previous epidemics or other disasters, what, how do you think about this question? What, what kinds of particularly um, journals or sources, letters that come from individual people, not from presidents or from kings, but from average folks. Um, what do those sources do for them, for us? And, and why do you find them interesting, if you do? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, as an anthropologist, um, my impulse is always to kind of figure out what ordinary people are experiencing, however you want to define ordinary, which of course is another kind of question that I think we're actually working through right now. Um, but I think what you get is, is all of the jumble of feelings and questions and thoughts that people are having. And that's one of the things I find exciting about this project. It's, it's not curated or condensed in the same way that kind of official materials would be. Um, and I think one of the, the nice things about journals is it encourages people to, to have a little bit more of a stream of consciousness about what 
is going on. Um, and which allows people looking at it later to pull out all kinds of things that maybe they didn't even intend for you to, to be pulling out from what they were saying. Um, so it's not a, a better or worse kind of source material, I would say. It's just one that um, traditionally, I think historians have worked with, um, but usually with, with just a very small number of people relatively who really are inclined to keep journals and then preserve those journals for people to look at later. And what we're trying to do here is to really collect a, a, a broad array of journals from people who might not normally journal um, mm -hmm. and make sure that they're preserved in a particular place alongside other kinds of information about those people um, like demographic information and health information. Um, we collect information about COVID status and political affiliation so that in the future, when historians look at this, um, they can get perhaps a broader array of kind of opinions, thoughts, and feelings of what was going on for different people, both in the US and elsewhere, because we have an international following as well. Um, along with information that might help them interpret that in some way. Um, and so we're hoping to kind of pre-design an archive uh, for future historians to do some of the work ahead of time for them so they don't have to go searching for things. Um, and to just bring in as many voices as we possibly can. Um, and the, the focus is really on, again, people who might not ordinarily be heard, who are not sort of political leaders or people in power and are not necessarily people who would proactively create records. Um, and that's what we're really kind of hoping to achieve here. Sarah, let me bring you in on this. And I, I was thinking about this just today as I was um, putting this, the obituary for today together. Mm -hmm. As Chief Henry um, died recently, but he actually participated. There was a small fire department, actually not that small, set of interviews that the fire department did in mm -hmm. New York just after 9-11. And he was one of the interviewees and I went and grabbed that interview and read it. And it was interesting, even in his telling of how, of how, of his experience of that day, it, the emphasis were on things that were very much on our mind in 2001. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe not things you'd have liked to known from him in 2005 or 2011 mm -hmm. or now. And, and it did get me thinking about some of the challenges of, what kind of lessons we draw from journals, interviews, maybe not even in the in the too distant past. Do you have some examples of, from cases in history where you found those kind of sources to be illuminating, strange, uh, compelling in some way? It's a terrific question. And you know, we're, we're not, neither of us is an, is an historian. So um, I think we can speak to examples that have come to us either through our broader horizons or the really terrific advisory board that we've pulled together. So, um, you know, we'll talk about this more, but we think of the journaling project as both a journaling platform for people to create their own archive, their own record, and also uh, the production of a historical archive that will have value for researchers. So we're trying to kind of um, do a couple of things at once and we've pulled together colleagues and also students who've helped us think about what that involves and how you do that. How do you do each of those things well at the same time? And it's tricky, um, we're growing and learning. Um, but one of the things that we've, we've done is um, speak with historians, including a colleague who's a Holocaust historian who has a good deal of experience thinking with uh, and, and studying and learning through journals and memoir and other kinds of diaries and personal materials about you know, the period of the early 20th century and the Third Reich and the experience of living in ghettos uh, in Nazi Germany and other parts of Europe. And he's been just um, really helpful in, in clarifying for us that from the very beginning that this is in fact valuable that what we're generating, what we're collecting will have value. We don't necessarily know now what kind of value it's going to have. But when we look at the collections of journal material, diaries and, and similar sorts of sources from the period of World War II or from other periods uh, in history, we see that they, they become these tremendous treasure troves for researchers. Um, there's another example that we're just beginning to learn about, I think, um, like a lot of COVID projects, we're kind of building the plane in flight and learning about analogous 
uh, projects as we go along. So there's a project called Mass Observation that similarly was developed, um, you know, during the the early 20th century at, at, by some social scientists, and then it kind of took a, a strange spin and and stopped, and then was uh, reincarnated uh, many decades later. But it's something of an analogy to what we're doing in the sense that a, a large group of people were kind of asked, record what's happening in your lives pretty much every day. And that research project has generated many articles and books and other um, research products. So um, certainly there are analogies. I think, uh, you know, those, those two examples are pretty clear illustrations of the fact that when you have personal narrative recorded in a form that's accessible to researchers, you get a sense of the texture of everyday life. You get a sense of the ways in which processes that we might read about at the macro level touch on the, uh, you know, intersect with the, the real life challenges and dilemmas of people just trying to go about and survive to feed their families, um, to achieve their own goals. Um, so it, it, I think what we're able to produce here is an opportunity to, to think about the big picture through the lens of, of many different individuals, each of whom is having a very different experience of this time. Sarah, let me just stay with that because it's a, it's of course it's a old methods problem in history, and I presume in anthropology too. You don't have unlimited time when you're gathering interviews or any kind of research materials. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about the um, your approach in having this to be uh, a resource that's open for anyone to participate in, rather than focusing on uh, a smaller number of people who you think might have a, a broader vantage point at this time. So why not interview mayors or members of Congress? Right. Why have it be open to to all people? And, and I'm asking you that question not because I have a answer to it, but because I want to know. <laughs> yeah. Kate, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? I can start and, and okay. you can fill in, I guess. Um, so, I mean, I think this speaks to two things. One of them is the other aspect that Sarah pointed to, aside from this being a research project of really trying to be a service, um, a, a place where people can come and um, write or record their voices or create art and, and just sort of get out what they are feeling. So there's a, lot, a large body of literature in psychology that supports the idea that expressive writing is good for people's mental health. Um, so while we're not promising any sort of improved mental health outcomes, we can't promise that, of course, um, we do think that there is a benefit uh, to people having a space to record what is happening. Um, we think it's also a benefit in terms of uh, providing a sort of a personal archive. So everyone who participates can download a full um, a, a full archive of everything that they've done. So if they, we have some people who have been journaling with us for months and months and they have every single weekly entry in, in kind of a easily accessible format that they can download and keep for their own family and for the future. Um, and in addition to that, I think that again, as anthropologists, we just have this impulse to get kind of the ordinary people's um, reflections on things and both of us, while we certainly could have reached out to mayors or Congress people and that's a very valuable thing to do, um, that just wasn't what we were interested in, the two of us. We, we really wanted to see what, like Sarah was saying, how these decisions being made by folks like that are being experienced on an everyday level by sort of regular people just trying to keep things going the way all of us are. Just a reminder that you're listening to COVID Calls, and today we're talking about the Pandemic Journaling Project with Sarah Willen and Kate Mason. So, all right, let's go back and let's talk about how you came up with the idea. I'm going to put the link up on the screen, and for those who want to find it, it's pandemic-journaling-project.chip.ucon.edu, or you can Google it and find it that way wherever you find websites. So um, why don't we just, um, Sarah, can, I, can you tell me kind of the origin story, how this idea came about? Sure. And, you know, I think as you heard, Kate's, Kate was looking for some way to kind of engage in a research vein with what was happening. I was as well. And um, I'll, in March, just as we were beginning to have a sense of what was happening and the ways in which it was really going to interrupt everything, some colleagues of mine and I were on an email chain. Um, I'm part of the leadership of the Human Rights Institute at the University of Connecticut. 
And a senior colleague of ours, a very distinguished historian named Richard Brown, um, wrote something in an email to a group of us that really just stuck with me. It, I found it deeply compelling and it kind of helped me channel some of the energy that I was feeling and that Kate was feeling too in terms of what we might do. And I'll just share that with you, with you if you don't mind. Um, so the, this is from an email from um, the historian Richard Brown, who's a board of trustees, distinguished professor at the University Emeritus at the University of Connecticut. And he wrote to a group of us in March, I think it was March 22nd. We are not often consciously thrust into history. Now we are. It is an opportunity to learn about ourselves and our society. Afterwards, it will be an occasion to assess later myth-making and conventional wisdom about the pandemic. And he went on and said some other things as well. Um, he wrote about his own experience and his wife's experience. And he did make an analogy uh, to the period of, of the Second World War. And kind of, you know, when a historian said what's happening is historic, something about that really landed and made me see, yes, you know, it really is worth creating a space to uh, for people to get their stories down and get their record down. Um, and all along, we've been thinking along these two tracks um, for a variety of reasons. One, we've really wanted to create something that would have value to people, that people would find interesting and, and maybe even you know kind of fun. Um, and also to think about how to how to create a, a historical record that would have value, and of course they're they're interlinked, right? Um, but the uh, the the ways in which we we created it were we, we really wanted to make sure that um, that we were producing something that people would see as having value for themselves over the, over the the long haul, and that's been kind of part of. Uh, the thinking from the very beginning. So we we had this idea, you know, this kind of reflection from um, from Dick Brown gave a kind of uh, authorization to the idea, and um, we just sort of started thinking together, talking to people, brainstorming. And one of the neat things about the project, um, it was very challenging at the time, but I think now, looking back, it's pretty cool. Because we're bringing together humanities scholars and social scientists, as well as health health social scientists, because we're trying to collect demographic data and also create a space for people to produce their own reflections, um, because we wanted it to be online, but we wanted it to be secure, because we wanted it to be uh, personal and also have historical value. We've kind of crossed every boundary, um, mm -hmm. every, you know, run into every barrier you can think of, um, just in trying to pull the thing together. Um, so it was a little tricky and challenging at the beginning, but I think we've we've pretty much hit our stride. And you asked a really important question uh, earlier, which is how does this become a historical record? Like what does it sort of look like from a research standpoint? And we can think of it as having a couple of elements. The first element is everyone who participates can log in at any point and download all of their material. And as Kate suggested, people can write, they can upload audio recordings, or they can upload photographs and reflect on those photographs. So that's always accessible to people for download. Um, and then there's the research archive that we're generating um, that's accessible to those on our team and other researchers who approach us and have a specific research question they'd like to pursue. And we can set up an arrangement whereby they can, they can work with us in analyzing the data. Hmm. We're then going to bring the material over to a, a data repository. Um, a qualitative data repository where it will stay for 25 years after we've finished data collection. And there it will be accessible um, you know, to any researcher with a legitimate research interest who wants to, to work with it. So we've been thinking from the very beginning about how to create something that will have value to many researchers in many different disciplines. And then after 25 years, it becomes a public record um, without gating um, and, and will be stored in university libraries. So we've thought about this in a staged way, um, very much as the creation, as, as Kate suggested, of a kind of pre-designed archive that will have value for researchers well beyond just, you know, the two of us or those on our, on our advisory board and our research team now. I'm really impressed with the sort of dual um, functionality of it right now in real time, taking into account that I think lots of people are using writing or other kinds of photo photography, um, whatever kind of creativity they're doing right now as a way to cope, mm -hmm. as a way to make sense. I had the brother and I had a brother and sister artist call and COVID calls earlier this summer mm -hmm. with Malka Older. You may know her work and DJ Older, and they both are novelists, mm -hmm. and she's an academic and disaster researcher. And they talked a lot about writing as a, a way of coping and making sense. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. of the time. So, you know, because not everybody, I know it hurts me to say this, not everybody cares to contribute to a historical sure. archive. So there's other, other levels to this that you seem to be exploring. I just want to bring in a question up here from Ken Dixon. I think you were just touching on this already. I, I think you've given us a kind of a first pass at an answer on this, but yeah. But maybe take it a step further. What are some of the themes that you're perhaps most interested in? Um, what parts of the world are you hearing from and not hearing from? Give us a little bit more what you're finding out now as it's been going for a little while. Kate, you want to take this? I think Kenneth has a great question. Yes. I could answer right away. Yeah, a great question. And I, I guess my initial response to Kenneth would be, we, we want you, because right now we do have a very disproportionate number of women, um, which, you know, we're, we're happy to hear from women. But what is the percentage, Sarah? Something like 75% or something along those lines Close. Um, of our Spencer women. Um, so we would definitely like to hear from more men. Um, and we've been, if anyone has ideas for how to uh, convince men that journaling is not just for women, that would be really helpful. Um, we also, you know, we actually have done a fairly decent job reaching out to um, a racially and ethnically diverse group of people. Um, and I think Sarah gave you the actual statistics for that, which um, maybe you can speak to if you have it on your screen, Sarah. But um, we, uh, the journalers right now are just under 50% white, um, and the other 51% is um, a, a broad range of people. So we're very glad to have um, some amount of racial and ethnic diversity. Um, we do skew uh, towards more educated sets. So we're definitely, you know, one of our goals is to reach out to people who wouldn't necessarily be comfortable writing very much necessarily, which was one of the reasons why we thought it was really important, first of all, to give people the option of contributing in visual or audio format, um, and also to be able to contribute via their cell phones. So you don't need a computer to participate in this project, which we had to go to quite a bit of trouble to make that happen, but we think it was really important that we do that um, because you know, worldwide, not just in the US, but globally, almost everyone has a cell phone now. Um, and mm -hmm. not everyone has a computer or access to a computer or access to high speed internet. So um, that was really important to us. So we're, we're continuing to kind of work towards trying to recruit more people who are lower on the socioeconomic status kind of scale who maybe wouldn't normally want to write. Um, and to, you know, offer them these other options and try to try to um, convince them that there's value for themselves, not just us, but also for themselves and both having this form of expression and also becoming part of the historical record. Do you want to add to that, Sarah? Sure, sure. I do have, um, just by the numbers, we've got more than 550 people who are participating so far. They're in 24 countries, if you can believe it. Um, mostly in the United States, a lot in Mexico and other parts of Central and Latin America, um, and some in Europe, and a few others from other parts of the world, from, um, from China, from India, from Israel. So, um, you know, we're, we're reaching out across the globe and would hope to continue doing that. Um, we have more than 4,300 individual journal entries in the archive so far, which is quite a lot. Most are, are, are writing um, text, but a lot of beautiful photographs or challenging photographs or provocative photographs with accompanying text or audio. And we do have some folks who are contributing audio. We'd love to get more. We've found that hearing people reflect, you know, you're hearing us now there's something really powerful about hearing people reflect on their lives in their own voice in real time. And some of the audio clips that folks have contributed are just deeply moving. Sometimes it's just a little bit about what happened today. Sometimes folks will tell a story, um, but those audio clips are, are really quite moving. Um, Kate mentioned that there are more women than men contributing at this point. We hope to get some change on that front. Uh, and about half of, of the folks who are contributing identify as white. Um, about 11% identify as Hispanic or Latino, about 9% as black, uh, about 7% as Asian or Pacific Islander, and 13% as mixed race. So you can see, you know, we're 
we're doing okay. We're do we can do better. We actually um, have a, a team that's going to meet on Friday morning to make a plan to, to make better inroads into some communities of color who we know are being hit disproportionately in the United States in particular uh, by, by COVID. Um, but we're, we think we're doing okay and, and we want to keep growing. But really, the, the short answer uh, to your important question, Kenneth, is anyone who feels like this is something they would like to have for themselves or to which they would like to contribute is most welcome. So I know it's a little early still in the in the project overall, considering you have this 25 year kind of trajectory for it. But um, mm -hmm. how many people are contributing? I mean, give me sort of a sense people are contributing anonymously or people who are actually identifying themselves and how you're approaching that aspect. Can you say a little bit more about that? Do people want others to know who they are and to, to have a sense of who's doing this creation? Or do people want this as a sort of a private stash of their thoughts at this time? So um, I guess I'll start. So this is uh, an anonymous platform. So we don't we don't publish any names. Um, we don't ask for names. Sometimes people state their names, um, and those pieces we do not put in the featured entries. So we're not. We have a featured entries page that has a selection of uh, journals that people have chosen to make public. Um, that's not the same as identifying themselves. It's something that they would be willing to have us put up on the page as an example of a journal entry. Um, and then we have a lot of entries that people have chosen not to make public. Um, so we never ask for names. Sometimes people give them. Um, but this is really meant as an anonymous platform. So not it, it's not the place to kind of broadcast your own thoughts on the pandemic and hope to get specific credit for it. Mm -hmm. Be that as it as it may, is it um, I'd like maybe you could tell us a little bit about the kind of ethical considerations that go into putting an archive like this together? Um, you know, even if somebody's not identifying themselves by name, they're still making themselves vulnerable to the researcher, to the platform, to the to the world out there. What kinds of questions were you asking each other and, and others as you were putting this together? Sure, maybe I'll tackle that one and Kate can fill in. So this is one of the interesting challenges that we had to work through because it's an interdisciplinary project. So we're anthropologists who have to get any research project that we propose through the what's called the institutional review board at our university the irb and what's the expected expectations of us are a little bit different than they might be of historians for instance um, we didn't try to put this through with an exemption that would allow us to actively seek out personal information rather we put it through the way we normally would which is we're going to protect our participants' identities and confidentiality. We want this to be anonymous. Certainly, we're not going to police or monitor what people are contributing in their own private space. But in terms of, and, and as Kate suggested, anytime someone contributes a journal entry, they make a choice of whether it's just for them and for the archive, or whether they would like to give us the option of, of posting it publicly and sharing it publicly. And so we do some screening on that count. We don't, as Kate suggested, we don't share anything that has identifiable names. We don't share any images with faces either. So again, if people want to archive photos of their family, that's terrific, that's wonderful. That will be in their journal, um, but we're not gonna share those images um, online. Similarly, we want folks to feel comfortable speaking in their own voice and recording their own voice but we're not going to sh publicly share audio in which there's more than one voice. So these are some of the ways in which we've tried to balance um, the requirements that, that are incumbent on us and that we also hold ourselves to as social scientists with our desire to create material that's going to be shareable and have public value. Now the historians might come in and say, well, there's a real deficiency here. We don't know the names of the people. We don't know, we can't trace their relatives. We can't figure out who else lived in their community. And that's that's a real limitation. It's a real concern. At the same time, 
because of the way we've designed the, the entire project, we do ask people a lot of questions the first time they contribute. And so we have a pretty robust set of demographic information. So we don't know a person's name. We don't know the names of their relatives, but we know, you know, again, based on self-identification, we know their race, ethnicity, their age, educational level, insurance status, religious identification. We know their zip code. So we do, we know a lot short of asking people to identify themselves by name. And just to stay with this, this theme, just for a second more, I, I do I think all of us who do this kind of work think a lot about the way we, the way we characterize disaster. Mm. And there's a challenge with that because the way disaster history has often been written and it, is that it's sort of an event and it occurs, it kind of drops in from somewhere and people experience it and then they get past it. But you've set up a platform here that I think just by the structure of it kind of pushes back on that idea mm -hmm. actually quite robustly, which is to say um, it's a process. Like this is gonna be here for a while for you, which indicates to people, and I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about this, kind of indicates to people this is not, the meaning of this is not to be apprehended all at once. And I, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that because and i say that because you know my colleagues in emergency management if you said to them hey this is a 25-year project I, I can imagine some of them will say well this if we do it right this shouldn't be a 25-year disaster so what the temporality you have in mind is something i'm interested in and, and reflecting a little bit on what that might be saying to people about this disaster i don't know if either one of you want to want to come in on that Sure. So uh, I'll clarify first that we're not going to be collecting data for 25 okay. years. So the, the 25 years is intended as an embargo period. And that's kind of speaks to the ethical question you posed, which is that um, we can't guarantee that people have not put identifiable information in their entries. So um, we don't ask for that information, but they might choose to put it in. Um, and as sort of an extra layer of sort of confidentiality and protection, we're gonna not release that information to the public for 25 years. Um, but I think you're right in that we're thinking about this in the much longer term. So, mm -hmm. you know, we launched this in May of 2020. We said that we will continue uh, running the platform until the World Health Organization, not the US, because for a variety of reasons, we didn't want to rely on the on the U.S. government, but the World Health Organization declares the pandemic to be over, um, and that is looking to be quite a long way away, uh, unfortunately. So um, usually, a pandemic is declared over, you know, even after the point at which people feel personally like it's over. So we do see this as a long-term uh, endeavor that we're going to keep going as long as we possibly can, um, up till and including that that moment in time. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right that we are not, we are trying not to look at it as a one-time event. This is a slog. This is a, a marathon. It is not a sprint. I think we're all really realizing that in a very visceral fashion these days as we head into the winter. Um, and so, you know, thinking about it, not as a moment in time, but as a, a longer term process of, you know, at least a year probably and possibly longer, um, there are different kinds of questions we can ask because we are trying to collect longitudinal information from the same people over time. So we have some participants who only participate for a week or two and then they're kind of done and that's it. But we also have a lot of participants who have been with us, you know, since we launched or since shortly after that. And so those folks, you know, their experiences have been changing over time, just like all of us, all of our experiences have. And I, when I think about this issue of time, I'm reminded of um, when we first launched in May, we got feedback from, uh, I, I guess, a, a friend or a colleague who said, you know, gee, I had so much to say in March. I wish you had launched this back in March. Um, and, you know, I would have had so much more to say, but it just seems like things are going back to normal now. And I remember thinking in the back of my head, Oh dear, I, I, I do not yeah. want to write about that. Um, and yeah. sure enough, you know, again, unfortunately, that that has come to pass. So, 
you know, we're we're hoping we rushed as fast as we could to get this out. Um, we would have loved to get it on in March, but the it's it's a process, obviously, to set something like this up. So, but once we had it up in March, we we're just gonna keep it going and just see, you know, what happens over time. That's to me one of the most astonishing parts of this, and why I want to keep connected with this project because I do think that this is not an ordinary. The time frame of this disaster is not one that people globally have seen recently. Be it, a lot of people live in disaster every day, so I'm talking about you know this sort of idea of people who do see this as a fundamental disruption of their daily life. I'll be fascinated to see those who who wrote early and then find you again later, mm -hmm. maybe even right about now. Um, mm -hmm. I think that'll be an interesting, I think the time frame of that is 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 really extraordinary. I, let me bring in, the, we've got a couple of good comments here, Jorge Benavides Rossen, first of all, mm -hmm. congratulating you on this project and asking, I think an excellent question. He asks, digital ethnographers pay a lot of attention to communities that form or exist online. Is there a plan for a spinoff community of journalers coming out of your project. I like that question because it sort of opens up the kind of radical idea that people will rip off your idea and run with it and go other directions with it. Um, thanks for that question, Jorge. I don't know. Um, Sarah, do you want to jump on that question? Sure. It's a terrific question. And I will say, I think we both have a very sort of um, egalitarian feel for this project and commitment to the project. So if someone wants to run with it, please, you know, go right ahead. Um, there's there are the whole world is living through this there are many voices that need to be recorded i think the more that are recorded the better um in terms of kind of what might happen with this particular platform here's another piece where we had to kind of try to think ahead and anticipate things that we might want to do or that other researchers might want to do down the road so the way we set things up Right now, we've got our demographic information that we're collecting. We're asking biweekly questions about mental health status, and we're asking periodic questions about COVID exposure and how people, things people are doing in their lives to protect themselves from COVID. But we've also kind of protected the, um, the opportunity to, to follow up with people. So, you know, we might at some point, um, and we hope we will at some point, go to a group of journalists and say, hey, you know, y'all who have something in common, we'd like to do some interviews. Would you be interested in doing some interviews with us? Um, and maybe having some focus groups. So we haven't necessarily thought about a spin-off journaling project, but we have thought about ways of homing in on particular groups of journalers uh, to try and get a deeper sense of what their experience is like and um, and how the pandemic is affecting them and, and their families. So for instance, one project that um, we're trying to get funded right now would focus on first generation college students and a parent or guardian. So we you know, try to make sure we've got enough folks who are committed to journaling for a period of time, about four weeks at least, and then interview the parent, interview the, yeah, the student, interview them together, and then um, invite them to do a kind of story core style interview with each other and then hopefully among this group, um, we'll see folks contributing photographs and then we can put together a little online exhibition of photographs and have a focus group and talk about those images. So that's the kind of spinoff project that we've been thinking through and, and trying to build so far. Do you find that that sort of reduces people's stress level a little bit or maybe it, it has the potential to increase participation when you give it more structure, more of a channel, more of a set of questions that indicate what where, what you're interested in, because I always find like when I'm working with students on writing, um, there's a there's a group of them who are, you just say, right, and they're like, they're on it, you know, but there's a yeah. much larger group that they want some guardrails, like they want to know what you're after, what do you want right. to know, and I know you don't want to guide it too much, but it sounds like you've thought about this a lot. We have, and I'll give a quick preview and then Kate can, can say more about this. So e each week, um, folks have an opportunity to contribute two journal entries and then a third if they have kind of more stuff they want to add. The first, uh, it, and they're organized around prompts. So the first prompt is the same each week. It's, you know, how is the pandemic affecting your life right now? Um, and that's consistent from week to week. For the second prompt, we do actually offer some guidelines. Um, basically taking a topic and offering, you know, usually it'll be, it'll be two, two options that are different angles on the same topic and people can choose. So we might have two questions focusing on the impact of the pandemic on work 
our finances. Or we might have two questions, two options focusing on the impact of the pandemic on relationships. Um, and we try to have one that's a little more intimate so for people who want to write a little bit more intimately and one that's a little broader looking outward. So people don't feel like they have to get super deeply personal, right? We're not trying to push people to self-disclose in ways that will make them uncomfortable. Um, but we are trying to give opportunities both, like you said, people want some guardrails or some direction. Um, and we also have, have interests. And again, we worked with our advisory board to come up with this long list of specific prompts because we do want to have insight into the impact on community. We do want to have insight into the impact of the pandemic on people's use of social media. Um, and we have this long list of topics, uh, probably over 100 at this point um, that we've pulled together. And we, we do kind of offer some direction. And if folks want to see how that works, Works, they're invited to visit the featured entries page of our website, um, which is the space in which we do offer up a curated set of entries that people have chosen to make public, that they have told us they are willing to make public. And we try in that space um, to give a pretty wide view of um, different kinds of voices. There's one thing that we haven't mentioned yet, and that's that the entire platform runs in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So if you log into the featured entries page, you'll see entries in both languages. So let's stay with that for a minute. I'm sure people are kind of, well, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I'm dying to know actually. Um, Kate, let me ask you this first um, from the featured entries. Things you've read thus far that have stopped you in your tracks, uh, entries that have really stuck with you, things that illuminated parts of the pandemic that you hadn't, hadn't thought of yet. I think people would be interested to know kind of what you are hearing already, what you are reading. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, some of these are just so moving um, and, you know, so heartbreaking some of the time, but there are also some that are really, you know, give you that feeling of hope, like there's a lot of humanity out there in the midst of all this horror, right? Um, I mean, I think people think of 2020 as being kind of a, a cursed year, but uh, people are, are also, helping each other. And, and so one of the entries that really has stayed with me and that I've shared with my students and it's they said it stayed with them as well, um, is it was an audio entry. So as Sarah said, there's something about hearing people's voices um, that is really quite powerful. And this was an entry from a young woman, I presume she's young, but she didn't say, um, who works in a, in a homeless services organization. And she was recording this entry in the middle of the night while, while on a, her shift. Um, and she had the hiccups, which really somehow my students love that because it lent this real humanity to it. But she told this just wonderful story about how, um, that because there's a national corn shortage, which is something that a lot of people don't know about, um, presumably because people are not going out and spending cash, right? So there's a national corn shortage right now. Um, and that might not seem like a big deal, but it's a very big deal to people who are homeless who have to wash their clothes in a laundromat and need quarters. Um, and so this whole entry was about quarters. Um, and she was telling this story of how she came back from, uh, she had taken you know, a vacation of some sort and she came back and realized that some of her clients had not washed their clothes in two weeks. Um, and the reason they hadn't washed their clothes was because they couldn't get quarters. And so she she was very upset about this because she felt like it was just very important that people have clean clothes to wear um, and some sort of dignity. And so she went home and she texted all of her friends um, and said, you know, there are these people who they can't wash their clothes and they need quarters. And because of the pandemic, there aren't any quarters. Can you get me some quarters? Um, and by the next day, her friends had sort of turned up on her porch, left $40 worth of quarters for her um, to give to these, these homeless clients. And she was almost crying when she told this story because she was saying, you know, everything is terrible and everything is grim. But, you know, you realize that when I asked for help and they didn't know who these people were, but they just wanted to feel like they were doing something, you know, it gave people a feeling of agency. And she said, you know, it just reminded me that people are really good. Um, and that entry really stuck with me because it was an example of, of 
first of all, of small things that people can do, right? Which is always sort of gives people a feeling of like, well, I, I'm not totally helpless. Um, but also just of the ways in which, and, and there are many examples of this actually in our featured entries page of ways in which people are trying so hard to find these bright spots and trying so hard to find things that they can do because people just feel so helpless right now. Um, and so that was one that really just really stuck with me. Sarah, I'd like to give you the chance maybe if you wanted to share one as well. Thank you for that, Kate. Sure, I would I would point to one and then, you know, I think one of the things that we're hearing a lot, we're hearing from a lot of very lonely people, a lot of people who are feeling deeply isolated. Um, many of them are retirees. Um, many of them are students. You know, we're sort of hearing, we're, we're also hearing from a lot of uh, very anxious and overwhelmed parents. Um, but one of the things that I find really powerful, you know, among all of these, these, um, you know, and not everything is deep, right? A lot of times people write something kind of silly or, or, um, or they're just expressing anger at politics. So we hear a lot of different things that people have to say, um, but one uh, series of uh, reflections that I found deeply moving was by a woman, um, I don't know, I didn't check, I think she's probably in her late 60s, early 70s, and she lost her father. And she writes over a series of weeks about the experience of uh, deciding that she and her siblings are going to come over and visit their father, even though they're not supposed to. And she writes about uh, losing her father. And she writes about, very movingly, about the funeral and the way in which she and her siblings found a way to memorialize her father that they felt would uh, dignify the occasion despite the constraints. She talks about how she and her sister went to their mother's grave to test the Zoom bandwidth to make sure they'd be able to stream the funeral live from the gravesite. And she talks about how in her tradition, in the Jewish tradition, there are uh, you know, some wonderful rituals of mourning and, and lending support to a family in mourning that were just not possible and what that felt like. Um, and she she included some photographs as well. Um, one of them is a photograph of the gravesite itself. And being able to follow her trajectory and see how this terrible loss was something that she found ways to to work through um, despite it all. I found both, you know, profoundly sad, but also really moving. And she said something that I think just kind of reverberates throughout our lives right now. She said, this wasn't a COVID death, but we had to follow COVID rules. And I think that's where a lot of us are right now. Um, but rather than kind of leaving on, on death, I would uh, just point to the fact that we're all, we have some artists um, who share their art pretty regularly, painting, collage, poetry, um, and, and that's really lovely as well. Um, and I think one of the things that we're seeing with the featured entries page is that for those who want to contribute in that way and who want to be part of a larger conversation, there is a kind of sense of community that seems to be emerging um, among some of the journals, certainly not all, you know, certainly there's the option of keeping things private, but we see people responding to each other's posts, um, sometimes getting angry at us for what we allow to be in the curated collection. Um, and that's kind of neat too, uh, to see that we're not that community of journalists that a questioner asked about uh, earlier, but there is a sense of community that's emerging for some. Let me let me stay with them. Thank you both for sharing those extraordinary examples of the idea of testing for for internet capacity um, at a mm. gravesite is something I hadn't thought about that yet. Um, but one of the thing that the example you gave, Kate, about about homelessness. I mean, a lot of times you know, when we start talking about disaster, then we kind of when we really get into it, we lose it which I think is good. What, and what I mean is that we start out, we're talking about Hurricane Katrina and we end up, we're talking about, we're talking about race. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that's, and I'm wondering if this is, has already shown up in your project. I mean, this disaster to me is inextricable from the story of poverty, racial violence, George Floyd, um, economic incapacity of wealthy nations. Um, that's coming into this, as as well, are you seeing that as uh, sort of emerging as one of the meta themes in the project? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, there's been a lot of writing about the about all of the um, protests that happened over the summer, all of the unrest. There were people who 
um, were relieved when we sort of indicated that you can write about things that are not directly related to the pandemic, even though I do see all of these things as very connected. Um, you know, we made a point of really letting people know that you can talk about these things. Um, and we found over the summer, a lot of people did. Um, a lot of people are talking about the election and it's amazing the way people are, are really seeing all of these things coming together in their own lives in terms of the anxiety that they're feeling, in terms of the sense of, of hopelessness and anger that they're feeling. Um, these things really can't be separated, I think. Um, and so we're definitely trying to make a space for people to draw those connections. Absolutely. Just want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls and we're talking about the pandemic journaling project with Sarah Willen and Kate Mason. Um, we're almost up on time and I just wanted to get one more question in about this because there's another layer to this that is already I think really op operative, which is that teachers who want to teach, I can imagine any number of things they may want to be teaching, may already want to pull on this as a resource, either for student engagement or for to begin to teach what this pandemic is. It occurred to me the other day, we'll be teaching, I've already taught a course on COVID and I've talked to lots of people who have, we already have enough material to begin teaching it sure. as a disaster. And we have to kind of sit with that for a second. It's already generating a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Talk to me for a second um, about how you see teachers interacting with it and what tools are built in for teachers. Sure, maybe I'll pick this up. Um, so we were approached very early on, in fact, by a colleague at CUNY Gutman at one of the community colleges that's part of, of the CUNY system in New York City, uh, who told us, look, I'm teaching this. I just want to let you know this is this is really quite helpful. And um, CUNY Gutman is a, a predominantly minority um, institution. So lots and lots of Hispanic students, lots and lots of, of African-American students and her students um, so Christina Baines is the colleague who reached out to us and her students were really finding the project meaningful and connecting with it. And so we actually started a conversation, brought her onto the advisory board. She worked with us to develop a model um, a model assignment that faculty can, can use if they wish. And then we went ahead and built an educator resource page. So if you go to our main site, which I see is on the screen right now, and you click on resources, you'll find uh, some mental health resources, and then you'll find an educator resource page where faculty can get some ideas. And you know, we certainly can't obligate any, none of us can obligate any of our students to participate in a research study of any sort, not this project and not any other project. But we do invite students and we invite faculty to think about different ways in which they can use these materials or participation in the project itself as an educational tool. So that's a place to look for some ideas. Um, the other thing I'd add is that we are in the process of seeking permission for adolescents to participate as well. So right now, um, to participate, you have to be able to manage the, the interface either in English or in Spanish, and you have to be 18 or older. Um, and then you have to have a smartphone um, or a computer if you prefer, but that's it. But we think that it's really important to offer the space to adolescents too. Mm -hmm. And hopefully within the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to open up, open it up in that way too. But adolescents will need permission from their parents. Um, but at that point, high school teachers might also see value right. in bringing the project into their classrooms in different ways. Well, just as we wrap up, I'd like to see if there's anything that um, we didn't cover that you wanted to, to bring to light or anything you wanted to say to recruit people to participate in the project. Let me just give you a chance to, to wrap up for us. Kate, let me, let me give you that first. Um, well, I guess I would just say that, you know, this, we really hope that people see this as a space for them and not just as a space to produce material for us or for researchers. And so I hope that people are finding meaning. I hope that people will feel free to contribute whatever they want, anything and everything that they are thinking and feeling or that they have opinions about. Um, you know, there there is, if you go to the featured entries page, um, it's a little bit of a slant towards uh, left-leaning kind of political views, but we welcome people from all ends of the spectrum. We want to hear from everybody about what they're thinking and feeling about this pandemic. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it all that I would add, Sarah. So. The one thing I would add is if you do look at our, um, our main page, 
we thought a lot about what our overall goal is. And if you look at the tagline at the top of the page, you'll kind of see that. We, we start off by saying, and, and this speaks to your earlier question, um, Scott, about you know, why aren't we interviewing mayors or other leaders? Um, so we say right here, uh, usually history is written only by the powerful. When the history of COVID-19 is written, let's make sure that doesn't happen. So that's really our goal. And we invite anyone and everyone who either wants to be part of history or who wants to just have their own chronicle for themselves, for their children, for their grandchildren, to take a look and see what you think. Tremendous project. Thank you both for spending this time. It's the Pandemic Journaling Project. And I've been talking with Sarah Willen and Kate Mason today on COVID calls. And I've got to have you come back maybe early in the new year and, and you can share a bit more of what you're already learning from the project at that time. I would love to hear from some teachers who are engaging with this. I, I'm so impressed with what you're doing. Thanks a lot for coming by COVID Calls today to talk about it. Thanks so much Thanks. for having us. Yes. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls every weekday at 5 p.m. Uh, we have another big week this week. Tomorrow, we're gonna be talking about the quarantine experience and we're gonna have guests who can describe that experience from the United States, from Belgium, from China, Taiwan, and mainland China, Taiwan, and South Korea. So it should be really great conversation. Please join me then. And until then, stay healthy, everybody. See you tomorrow, five o'clock. Bye. Bye.